We have a go for main engine start. Mission and liftoff of the Scout Star, celebrating its 25th birthday by racking up science and supplies to the space station. The uh, solid rocket boosters uh, are all away. Columbia Houston, UHF Comch. Nine hundred and seventy five days after the Challenger disaster, the NASA Space Shuttle program officially returned to flight status with the seventh launch of Discovery, STS twenty six, on the twenty ninth of September, nineteen eighty eight. It was the first mission since STS four to have the astronauts wearing pressure suits during launch and landing, one of many precautions taken due to the launch's nervous atmosphere. It was also the first all veteran mission since Apollo eleven, with all crew members having flown at least one prior mission to space. The mission went exceptionally well with only two minor problems. First, the flash evaporator system for cooling the orbiter iced up and shut down, forcing the astronauts to deal with a cabin temperature of around 31 degrees Celsius until the fourth day of the mission. Additionally, one of the communications antennas malfunctioned during the deployment and had to be stowed for the mission's duration. One notable incident of the mission involved its use of an experimental voice control unit. Initially, the unit was found to be only 40 to 60% accurate in identifying the crew's speech and the templates for it had to be retrained, bringing its accuracy to around 96%. The problem? The human voice changes in microgravity, and the machine had been calibrated to hear the astronauts on Earth. The missions directly following the program's return to flight status are most notable, to me, for their deployment of a few very special probes. First, on May 4th, 1989, the Magellan probe was deployed from Shuttle Atlantis. This probe, constructed for the orbital exploration of Venus, ended an 11-year gap in any interplanetary probe being deployed by the United States. Magellan's goals included obtaining near-global radar images of the Venusian surface, obtaining a near-global topographical map, and obtaining gravity field data of the planet. After being deployed from the shuttle, Magellan's inertial upper stage booster fired into a Type IV heliocentric orbit, where it would circle the sun one and a half times. Fifteen months later, it reached Venus on August 10th, 1990. It then boosted itself into an elliptical orbit that would bring it only 295 kilometers from the planet's surface at its closest. This allowed it to collect radar and imaging data while close to the planet, and then transmit that data back to Earth when it was further away. Let's just take a moment here and enjoy some of the gorgeous images of Earth's hellish twin sister that the probe managed to take. The second deep space probe to be deployed by a space shuttle was the Galileo spacecraft, deployed from Shuttle Atlantis on October 18, 1989. Galileo was, as its name implies, designed to study Jupiter and its moons. Similarly using the inertial stage upper booster, Galileo was put on a trajectory to first intercept Venus and then use its gravity to slingshot itself further toward Jupiter. On its way, it would encounter 241 Ida, a large asteroid in the asteroid belt, and discover that this lopsided space potato has its own moon, which was named Dactyl. Galileo studied our solar system's largest gas giant for two years, traveling in elongated ellipses that allowed it to get several good looks at the planet's many moons. Once again, let's just take a moment and enjoy some of the beautiful imagery Galileo captured during its mission.
I'd like to end with another NASA oopsie, though thankfully, this one was only expensive instead of fatal. On the 24th of April 1990, Shuttle Discovery launched and deployed the Hubble Space Telescope, which we all know and love. However, some of you may remember that when it was initially deployed, Hubble was essentially broken. Within weeks of the launch, the returned images indicated a serious problem with the optical system. Just take a look at this image of what was supposed to be a star. Analysis of the images showed that the problem was a flawed mirror, which had been polished in the wrong shape. And here's how barely wrong it was. The mirror was 2200 nanometers, too flat, to produce quality images of the cosmos. This blunder briefly made NASA a laughingstock, since Hubble had cost about $4.7 billion and was effectively useless. Second thought, how about a black Russian? Very well, sir. Thankfully, NASA had a solution to that problem. However, we'll cover that in the next episode. Some of you guys may remember that this used to be a channel mostly dedicated to debunking the Flat Earth conspiracy. For those folks, I'd like to pose a question for those idiots. Why on earth would NASA want to fake launching a broken $4.7 billion telescope? If you like this video, please give it a like. If you want to see more, please subscribe to my channel, which is Dead Kennedy in Space. If you want to support me further, consider donating on Patreon or purchasing some of my work through Amazon or Teespring. Thank you, and I'll see you over the curve, Space Cowboys. Live there. On the mode of dust. Suspended. In a sunbeam. In a fast cosmic arena.